From the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope that you and yours are safe, sheltering in place in a comfortable environment, and we look forward to greeting you back in the Yacht Club just as soon as conditions permit. Our speaker today was born in Pasadena, California, and raised in Carmel. The first time she ever got on any boat of any kind was after her father sold a script in Hollywood that allowed him to take a banana freighter to Panama. He was a radio and television writer, and in fact was the co-writer of One Man's Family, which was set in the Seacliff neighborhood of San Francisco. It was a radio drama. Those younger viewers of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon are asking, what is a radio drama? drama. Well, before there were podcasts, before there were computers, before there were televisions, I know that seems like ancient history, there were radio dramas, and her father was one such writer. At any rate, after growing up in Carmel, she went off to Radcliffe College and became the second class of Radcliffe students to be granted a degree to be granted to be granted a degree from Harvard when the two colleges merged uh, during her tenure. And in fact, she became the first female graduate of Harvard to become president of the Harvard Alumni Association. After college, she went off to New York and became a researcher at National Educational Television, the predecessor to PBS, and then off to Los Angeles where she became an NBC consumer and medical reporter because that's a job that they could give women back in those days. She was at that time one of only two on-air women on all of NBC. In 1971, she was fired for having a baby. This is before Title IX and things like that could happen. She then went on to a, a career in radio as a morning drive time commentator on KABC in Los Angeles. And because she had a newborn baby, in order to accommodate her five to 9 a.m. hours, they set up a studio at her house in Beverly Hills so that she could broadcast from her house. In fact, her little son would go from being four years of age to 21 years of age while she was doing these programs. At age 40, she wrote her first book and has since written 13 novels, two nonfictions, the 13th of which, or the 15th book overall, is about to be published in September. It's called A Spy Above the Clouds, and she's here to talk all about it. So welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, C.G. Ware. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I want you to know I bring you greetings from across the bay, from your baby sister yacht club, the Sausalito Yacht Club. We know we're just small pickings, but we send our very best. And I know compared to the St. Francis, uh, our club only got started in 1942, a year just after the entry into World War II. But then we know that all of us in both organizations, we share a love of boating, we share this love of the sea, and I hope we share a love of history, which we're gonna talk a little bit about today. I wanna comment on what you just mentioned, CG, because everybody should recognize who are members of yacht clubs, that we should see all other members of yacht clubs as brothers and sisters, and we should feel pity for all their fellow boat owners. And I know that you, for years, vacation on your trawler in Sausalito Main Harbor, and you weekended on it, and everybody who owns a, an old wooden boat should show a special sympathy for other wooden boat owners. As a guy with an 84-year-old wooden antique racing boat, I have nothing but empathy, sympathy, and love for other wooden boat owners. So I have felt your pain. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, CG. Tell us how you got into the idea of writing a book about incredible female spies in World War II. I'd hope that the title of today's conversation and this woman's lovely picture on your screen would catch your attention. Does this woman look like a spy? She was. And you'll hear all about her and all with the tales about some other amazing American Mataharis during this hour, focusing on American women secret agents during World War II. Ron asked me, how in the world did I become obsessed on this topic? 
you probably wonder. Well, I literally stumbled on the subject of American women agents utterly by accident about five years ago before many of the current explosion of World War II novels really go along. But in September, I am going to be launching book two of what I've called my American Spy Sister series. It's called A Spy Above the Clouds, which does mark my 13th novel and 15th published book. So today I thought I could give you all a look at some of the real life prototypes I use to create fictional characters in these two historical novels about women and espionage during World War II. So how in the world does a writer weave fact with fiction? Well, in the case of the real women heroines in World War II, the facts about their roles are truly much more astounding than anything a novelist could have possibly invented or imagined. For 23 years, as you heard, I dealt with just the facts as a broadcast and print reporter in Los Angeles. And here I am in my really messy home studio that ABC created for me, sort of where my uh, furnace used to be. I logged 18 years broadcasting from 5 a.m. to 9 on KBC radio and TV in LA. And also I was a journalist for national magazines and a writer producer and on-air host for a public affairs program on PBS in LA. Now, somewhere during those years, I did write two nonfiction books and just thinking about those years makes me really tired. But this mixed up skill set helped a lot when I decided to chase a story set in World War II some 80 years ago. Well, heaven knows I have plenty of company writing about World War II. Ever since 1995 marked the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II and the opening up of formally secret government archives. So scholars and nonfiction writers busily began after 95 to mine the files and produce so many books about heretofore unknown stories of wartime heroism and betrayal. A French friend took me to a tiny resistance museum and cemetery, and it was near a place called Lake Annecy in the French Alps, where I saw photos of women secret agents casually tacked up on the walls. Immediately, of course, reporter that I am, I wanted to know, why don't I know about this, that women were secret agents in World War II? Looking at those displays, my instant question was this. Were there any American women sent behind enemy lines in World War II? And these incredible American women I'll be describing to you today parachuted, hiked over mountains, or floated onto France's shores in rubber dinghies, hulking submarines, warships, and leaking fishing boats called feluccas, or otherwise stealthily slipped into war-torn France between 1941 and the end of the war to assist the French resistance fighters battling the Nazis that had illegally invaded and occupied their country. But as you can see from this wartime poster, men in uniform were soon warned that every woman they encountered might not be who or what she seemed. Spies might be everywhere, even in bars and in brothels, near British airfields, and they very well might be female spies, testing new recruits as to whether or not they could keep secrets. Regardless of nationality, as this audience probably knows very well, boys will be boys, French, British, German, or American, the men were cautioned all the time, keep mum. She's not so dumb. So I discovered in the course of my research that there were some 60 gun-toting women agents, British, French, Belgium. The service was the SOE, officially the British Secret Operation Executive, founded before our OSS or AIDS and even tortured. And the answer was yes, there were a very few American women working undercover for Britain behind enemy lines as the war began even before, of course, U.S. joined the Allies in World War II after Pearl Harbor. Now, some of you know that Chef Julia Child was in the Pacific Theater, later working for the American OSS. But what about other American women in other theaters of war during the 40s? There have been an avalanche of nonfiction books on World War II like this one, 
Churchill's Angels that have been published in recent years. And as I mentioned, in 95, many of the formerly secret archives were open to scholars and nonfictions alike. Likewise, the Official Secrets Act, which kept people never speaking about their past, was relaxed and ended in some cases, along with similar US strictures, as well as classified files were finally opened. So access was eventually granted to scholars and historians, giving the public a better, more accurate picture of what led up to the war and how it was conducted on both sides of the conflict. Now, after 95, fiction writers like I am began to read all these books and see what drama there was in telling some of the truths behind the myths of war. So for so long, the few numbers of women secret agents that participated in the clandestine world were known only around the British War Office as Churchill's Angels. Now, these women that you see here marching along with their Sten guns often functioned as couriers on trains, bicycles, hiking, boats, or skiing from place to place. They were also wireless operators, code breakers, and even leaders for guiding down flyers or compromised secret agents or other important at-risk persons. Now, of some 25 captured women agents of those 60, that were infiltrated by the Brits. At least 15 are known to have been brutally beaten and executed by the Nazis with bullets to their back or put sometimes still alive in the ovens in concentration camps. And this young woman who was East Asian with an American mother was one of them. Now, as you can see from these images though, women played many, many roles during World War II, but it is noteworthy that the women's secret agents were often quite good looking, projecting the German male notion that if they were pretty, they couldn't be suspected of being smart enough to be in the enemy's intelligence service. In the early course of my research, I discovered three American women who joined the British SOE, the Special Operations Executive, enrolled as secret agents, mostly in the early stages of the war, or later women who also worked for the American counterpart, the OSS, which was the Office of Strategic Services, which later evolved into our present day CIA. Now here they are three, left to right, you see Virginia Hall, Virginia Hall, you'll hear a lot about her later, had a wooden leg. The woman in the middle is Amy Elizabeth Thorpe. She stole secret French naval codes. And the woman on the right, Barbara Lowers, was born in Eastern Europe, but she became a naturalized American citizen in 41 and was quickly channeled over into the OSS and onto Italy. So I know about her, but I did not concentrate her. But more on the first two in a bit. And then there was one of my favorites, this amazing woman, Elizabeth Devereux Rochester Reynolds. She became her uh, life as a sleuth and she insisted on being called Dev. And essentially in the words of her mother, she was a spoiled brat playgirl who preferred shushing down snowy Alpen resorts to applying herself to her formal education. A New Yorker by which had a huge impact on her, by the way. Her story is chronicled in a very long forgotten autobiography called Full Moon to France. And apparently that's her landing in a parachute. In it, Dev describes how she spent much of her life as a secret operative for the British as a courier on skis in the Alps, transporting messages and hand grenades in her backpack. More on her astounding saga later, but Dev Devereux Rochester became the prototype for my fictional heroine, Constance Viv Vivier Clark in A Spy Above the Clouds, which Ron just mentioned is coming out in September. And many of her adventures played key parts in the plot. Now famous in her day, but definitely shouldn't be forgotten in ours, was the American dancer, singer, actress, comedian, Josephine Baker, at least two novels have already been written about her, along with several major biographies. Now, Baker was living and performing her exotic feather dance, which you see there on the right, her wonderful feathers. She was absolutely gorgeous. As a refugee from Jim Crow discrimination that she had experienced in America. When the Germans invaded Paris in June of 1940, Baker immediately joined the French Red Cross. 
Soon after, she became an active member of the Free French Resistance Movement of Charles de Gaulle via her direct contacts within Paris's French underground. So she wasn't in the SOE, but she was definitely an American spy. Using her career as cover, Breaker became an active intelligence agent for de Gaulle's faction, carrying secret messages written in invisible ink on her sheet music. She was awarded the Croix de Guerre and the Légion d'honneur by order of French President Charles de Gaulle himself. Well, the government entity that was given responsibility for these some 60 women agents, including the Americans that I've introduced you to, into enemy territory was the top secret SOE, British Special Operations Executive, known variously as the firm, the org, the outfit, or the racket, and by some admirers as Churchill's angels. Now the agency was set up in five floors of offices at number 64 Baker Street in London, a half a block away from number 22, the fictional home of Britain's most famous sleuth, Sherlock Holmes. Now, established in the summer of 1940 during the heart-stopping evacuation at Dunkirk, Britain and France's most disastrous defeat, Britain was frantic to get information as to what was going on in occupied Europe now that they'd abandoned the continent and beat a full retreat back to their island. Basically, these amateur French-speaking sleuths including women recruits, with perhaps one week of practice jumping out of real airplanes, risked life and limb before they even landed behind enemy lines. On a research trip to London, I found my way to the plaque on Baker Street commemorating the headquarters of the Special Operations Executive. Just as the Brits were desperate to know what was going on in German-occupied Europe, I too was perishing to learn more about the women, and especially the American women, who had become secret agents for the Brits. I discovered that one goal of the women's secret agents often was to assist in organizing the parachute drops of goods, medical supplies, and weapons in remote areas of France before the Germans could find them. A very risky business indeed. So how does a novelist like me in the 21st century, get wind of a story about the small number of American women working for British intelligence. As I mentioned, I virtually stumbled across this subject because of the fellow in the right-hand picture. Look carefully. The boy in the back row left with the white collar is 12-year-old Tony Cook. As a youngster, both he and his father attended the McJanet camp in the French Alps, run by an expat American schoolmaster, Donald McJanet, with tents pitched beside the lake near the border with Switzerland. It's Lake Annecy, I call it Tahoe, with really good food. As a result of that childhood experience, Tony, who you see there on the left, standing in the middle of the Alps with his matchless motorcycle at a age about 21, I'd say, Eventually, he became president of the McJanet Foundation that continues to this day, bringing Americans over to the village of Talbot for summer of learning French and studying international relations. And that's him in the middle there in his blue shirt holding a glass of wine. For some 30 years, we had had the very tough assignment of attending board meetings in this stunning Alpine location. But did we know it had been a hotbed of French resistance unlike anywhere else in France? It turns out we had dumbly walked by and been oblivious to many of the local markers commemorating the fierce fighting that went on during World War II in this mountainous region. One amazing day, a French friend of ours insisted that we visit the resistance museum just up the gorge in a small mountain chalet with a big sign telling anyone who passed by this lonely mountainous spot, here is the Museum of the Resistance to the Nazis in the Haute Savoyade, the high regions of land once ruled by the Duke of Savoy. 
one of the first things I saw inside that tiny museum was this photograph on the left, literally pasted up on the wall, identified as Odette Sampson Churchill. And outside the chalet were the graves of some local partisans who we learned later that day had died fighting the Germans in 1944 at the nearby Plateau de Glière, a battle neither Tony or I had ever heard of in all the years of going to Lake Annecy and Talwar. Now the woman's name, Odette Sampson Churchill, of course, jumped out at me. Who the heck was she? Why did a woman with a French name also have Churchill attached to it? She was young and wearing a British uniform. The placard said, quote, captured on 16 April, 1943, horribly tortured, survived war in Ravensbrück concentration camp, awarded George Cross. A British flag at the bottom signified she was a British secret agent. What was she? Now that day at the Resistance Museum, proved to be just the beginning of a five-year journey back to the 1940s. And following Odette's trail led me directly to the discovery of the American women living in Europe when the war broke out, who joined the British intelligence agency even before America joined the allies against the Nazis. I also learned that day about the 800 local resistance fighters who died on the Alpine Plateau right above us that you can see there in the distance of this picture on the left, where 800 partisans were massacred by the Nazis only a few months before the Americans finally arrived in the region. But the survivors in the Alpine districts eventually got their revenge. My research ultimately revealed that with the help of Devereux Rochester, the American SOE member who was the courier on skis in the Alps, the region in and around the town of Annecy at the head of the lake of the same name liberated itself even before the allies arrived. The Annecy townspeople rose up and kicked out the Germans in retribution for the scores of Savoyards who had been executed in the town square or deported to slave labor in concentration camps. We learned that there wasn't a family in the region that we had visited for so long that had not been affected by the brutal warfare that had been waged for nearly five years in this most beautiful part of France. Here we were that summer a few years ago and right under my nose were examples of the subjects I have always been writing about these last 30 years. What were the women doing in any particular period of history? Well, in World War II, they were serving as mostly unsung heroines right beside the male secret agents and equally risking their lives to fight the terrible Nazi scourge raging through Europe in the late 1930s and 40s. The woman pictured on the right here was another American, an intelligence agent whom I discovered only a month ago named Virginia Dalbert Lake, hailing from Florida. This Virginia was a school teacher visiting Paris who met and then soon married a Frenchman just before the war started. Together, they became part of what was known as the Comet Line and personally delivered nearly 70 allied airmen along a section of what was this pilots to 60 miles south. It was part of an escape route to the border with Spain. And from there, additional guides would take the pilots over the Pyrenees to safety. Once arrived in marginally neutral Spain, the airmen then made their way to British controlled Gibraltar and were flown back to the UK to fly for the Allies on another day. In May 1944, just weeks before the city of Annecy liberated itself, Virginia Lake was caught by the SS. And like Odette Sampson Churchill, she was sent to the notorious prison, Ravensbrook. Now you're gonna to have to read book three, which I haven't even written yet in my American Spy Sisters series to find out what happened to Mrs. Dalbert Lake. But why would any of these women I've told you about sign up for such unwomanly warfare as Churchill called it? 
Well, for answers, let's begin with Winston Churchill himself. Given that many of the male British secret agents sent clandestinely into France, stiff upper lips and all, were quickly spotted as conspicuous enemy English and apprehended as the spies they were and then executed, Churchill was in construction scripted and sent to Germany for forced labor, mostly because of the cultural assumptions about their gender. The Germans generally considered women too weak to do much more than care for the kinder, home, and hearth because of this cultural bias. So women could travel on the street and not be often suspected of espionage or of carrying hand grenades in their bicycle baskets. Now, many of Churchill's key leaders were skilled in the lesser known principles of guerrilla fighting. They proposed, why not train women in those skills too? And so for the first time in military history, women agents heading behind enemy lines were trained to jump on moonlit nights with heavy parachutes on their backs from low flying planes into enemy territory. In Churchill's view, the Geneva Convention prohibiting women in combat did not account for Germany's war on the civilian population. The Blitz was then killing tens of thousands of allied civilians, including women and children. But what sort of women, especially Americans, before we'd even joined the war, would be willing for such duty? Where the life expectancy of a radio operator was, on average, six weeks, and explosive specialists, not much longer. Even if they were patriotic enough to ignore these terrible lethal odds, they had to be women in top mental and physical condition. They also had to show self-reliance, discretion, and be capable of handling heavy weapons and able to stand up to rough and arduous training, often working days without rest once they slipped behind enemy lines. There would be scarcity of food, of heat, of little luxuries like chocolate or soap. 90% of them would have their menstrual periods cease entirely. They would leave young children behind, go into peril without family or friends having any idea what they were up to because they had sworn to uphold the secrecy of the Official Secrets Act. Most were French speakers between the ages of 18 and 35. To prepare for their assignments, they were sent to a series of boot camps, just like the men. Spy schools, you could call them, that were secreted away in mansions like you see here on the right and country estates all over England and the wilds of Scotland. Again, who in the world would willingly sign up for such boots on the ground, hard duty. Which brings us full circle to this woman. How did this pampered high society young woman living a gilded life in the nation's capital like Amy Elizabeth Thorpe enlist in the British cause and become the prototype in book one of my spy sister series, my heroine, Catherine Thornton, in landing by moonlight. The agent had a dad, a Marine attache father who was called Captain George Cyrus Thorpe, who was attached to embassies all over Europe in the 1930s. The story of how she turned herself into an American Matahari by the time she was 28 provided the basic plot for my book one. Amy Elizabeth Thorpe known as Betty, was well-connected in Washington, D.C. social circles. Married at 18 years old, shotgun style, because she was pregnant at the time, to a British diplomat, Arthur Peck. But she very soon was bored and miserable with her much older spouse. People she knew, including some intelligence officers in D.C., considered her a highly accomplished flirt. When approached, she agreed to go underground for Britain to turn, you should know, code word seduce, a press attache in the French embassy in DC. Her mission was to entice him through sex to help her steal the French Vichy naval coding you see on the right, and to steal the codes 
Betty and her accomplice, lover, certainly did at three o'clock in the morning. Getting these codes removed from the safe, taken away and photographed, returned to the DC's French embassy building with no one the wiser in one night was crucial if Churchill were to learn what the Germans and the turncoat Vichy French Navy were up to in the Mediterranean where the Axis forces controlled North Africa. Betty and her husband, Arthur Pack, had long been separated by the time she agreed to approach the man you see on the right of the screen, then the French press attache. This same press attache would one day become Betty's second husband, Charles Bruce, seen here in their later years. Unrepentant sleuth that I am, I searched Wyoming Avenue in DC to see if the scene of the crime was still there. And sure enough, as you see on the left here in an iPhoto picture I snapped in our car driving by, I took a few years ago there. There is the former mansions still on DC's Embassy Row, but now flying a different country's flag. So wait, let me ask you a question. So essentially, she's not behind enemy lines in this case, but she's become the seductress of a German attache or a French attache to Germany, which is it in DC? At that time, France was controlled by the Vichy French, who were the collaborators with the German takeover in France. And so this guy, though, had been a, a pilot in World War I. He didn't like the Germans at all. He ended up not liking his bosses in Vichy because he was a French patriot, but he was in the diplomatic corps and he was kind of sucked into it all. And here he was assigned in DC as a French press attache. And so Betty sashayed into the uh, embassy saying she wanted to interview him and get another point of view about the German takeover. And then she made friends with him. They went out to lunch and they had an affair immediately and she completely turned him and he fell madly in love with her. And together, then they pulled off the caper of stealing the codes that were in a big safe with the help, by the way, of a penitentiary safe cracker. So he crawled through a window, cracked the safe. They got the stuff. They took it out, photographed it, brought it back, slammed the door and then snuck out as lovers uh, past the guard in the front. And so they were amazing. And that whole story is in the book. <laughs> so in other words, this real life episode of a spy American turning a disgruntled sympathizer inside of D.C., not in not in Germany, not in France, but in D.C. OK, and then you took these elements and stuck them into your book, adopted them within the book. That's right. Wonderful. Well, the real agents that copied those naval cipher books undetected are now credited by the Allies with being able to outfox the Axis powers and eventually conquer North Africa because they knew where all the different uh, naval ships were. And it became a major turning point for the war. The Allies went from Africa, which they finally conquered thanks to the naval codes, to the toe of Italy. And then they fought their way up the boot and eventually they invaded the south of France in August of 1944, eight weeks after D-Day in Normandy. So talk about your unsung heroine, Amy Elizabeth Betty Thorpe Pack Bruce definitely deserves to be sung about. And my other wild child among the some 60 women who were sent behind enemy lines by the special operations executive in Britain was this American, Devereux Rochester. She was brought up mostly in Europe and caught there at the outbreak of World War II. Her British mother, living in Paris, was quickly interned by the Nazis at Vital, a camp for enemy aliens outside the city. Threatened with internment herself, Dev eventually made her way to London and was accepted in the British Special Operations Executive Intelligence Agency. Now, despite her morbid terror of leaping out of an airplane because her father had died in World War I in one, once behind enemy lines, this expert skier was assigned to be, what else? A courier on skis for a French resistant network run by a British major in and around, guess where, 
Lake Annecy in the High Alps. Now I found the memorial that marks the spot where Dev and her team set explosive charges in the Annecy train yard to help stop fresh German troops from arriving in France by rail. We never noticed the marker that was adjacent to the post-war train station that we had been passing through for years. Later that same trip, we walked the Plateau de Gliere, an enormous high green meadow surrounded by even higher mountains where, as I mentioned, some 800 resistance fighters were mowed down by German air power. As this was about to happen, Devereux Rochester was ordered by the SOE brass in London to escape from the Alps before she got caught. Well, she disobeyed the order and went back to Paris to see what had happened to her mother imprisoned in the internment camp. So soon after Dev's arrival in Paris, a neighbor betrayed her to the Gestapo and she was sent to a brutal prison outside Paris. Dev tried to escape and was put in solitary confinement for several months. Then unexpectedly, the prison released her when she never cracked or admitted she was a secret agent because her cover story was that she was just a spoiled American young woman trying to find out where her mother was and apparently convinced her harassed captors who didn't have enough food to feed anybody that she was too dumb to be a spy. Now at the war's end, Deb was thin, depressed and exhausted, but she remained in France for the rest of her life working in a Paris advertising agency. She never married and was afflicted in her last years with multiple sclerosis. France bestowed on her its highest civilian medal, the Legion of Honor. Devereux Rochester was a great, 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 great grandniece of Leland Stanford and inherited some money after the war from his estate, allowing her to live the rest of her life in her own house in Brittany. And here is yet another American spy named Virginia who started out, guess what? Baltimore socialite. Virginia Hall's original dream was to be a US diplomat in the State Department's Foreign Service. Educated at Radcliffe and Barnard Colleges, she was bored there and her rather progressive parents agreed she could go on to the Sorbonne and study in Paris. After a year of learning French, she went on to study in Vienna, soon mastering a second language, which helped her in her to get a job in the US Foreign Service as a lowly clerk. Often frustrated by the misogyny throughout the ranks of the diplomatic corps, she spent her free time riding horses and was a keen sportswoman and hunter. One December day on a hunting excursion near her post in Turkey, the trigger of her gun caught on a fold in her coat. The bullet ripped through the lower part of her left leg and through her foot, shattering every bone in its path. At the end of a painful recovery, she was minus her leg from the knee down. Yet with a wooden prosthesis, she was remarkably able to do nearly everything she could before the accident. However, she was soon also minus her job, resigning in frustration in May of 1939, convinced that a woman with a disability could never get out of the typing pool. Virginia ignored her mother's pleas to return to the U.S. and headed for Paris. Over the summer and the fall of 1939 during Europe's phony war, she and her friend Claire enlisted in a Red Cross type organization and were given the rank of private second class assigned to duty as an ambulance driver. It was tough, bloody work that she did up until the Germans entered Paris in June of 1940. America, remember now, had not yet entered the war. So Virginia was able to leave France for Britain on her American passport in hopes of finding some useful work to do to fight the Nazis from there. She traveled by ship and by train and was eventually put in touch with Vera Atkins, who you see there on the right, who turned out to be the number two in the Special Operations Executives French section. 
Virginia's wooden leg didn't seem to be a problem for an agency desperate for new recruits who spoke French. As Vera Atkins commented, no one would even notice. However, Virginia Hall wouldn't be returning to France as a secret agent by parachute, but rather by plane to Spain and back into France by train, dodging Nazi checkpoints every mile of the way. Eventually, with the cover story of being an American journalist in France for the New York Post in April of 1941, just before Pearl Harbor, she was posted to Lyon, where for many months, based her days at the Vaserie de la République, seen here on the left, and had a room at the Grand Nouvelle Hotel until her clandestine activities organizing local resistance groups made it too dangerous. With the news that Klaus Barbie, later known as the Butcher of Lyon, was after her, Virginia Hall caught the last train out of the city before his goon squads came knocking at her door. Barbie had made wanted posters printed and demanding the apprehension of the, quote, limping lady. Now, Virginia managed to flee to the south of France and hike over the Pyrenees, just like Devereux Rochester had done suffering the mumps, only Virginia did it. She survived somehow and returned to the UK, where she begged to be sent to wireless school. And she was. So once Virginia Hall completed the course, she soon demanded to be sent back, concocting a disguise as an old peasant woman with dyed gray hair, a fake hump on her back, sporting a cane and flaunting her limp. She was brought across the channel in this warship, dumped overboard in a rubber dinghy and rowed herself ashore, where she assisted diverting the Germans as U.S. tanks rolled from Normandy toward liberating Paris. With her teams of resistant fighters seen on the left, they destroyed bridges, disrupted communication, and blew up and derailed scores of German trains. She was the boss of hundreds of resistance fighters. In 1945, she received the Distinguished Service Cross for her, quote, extraordinary heroism against the enemy and married a fellow secret agent, a good head shorter than she was. For the next two decades during post-war years, she worked for the newly created CIA, considered a key offensive weapon in an expanding Cold War. However, her talents and her fabled history were shunned and ignored by a new breed of agent, and she was consigned to desk jobs. She had begun to feel like a relic with no respect paid or even knowledge of the part she had played as an heroic American woman secret agent. Virginia Hall became a textbook case of gender discrimination and utter disillusionment and resigned from the CIA. A final indignity was when Virginia Hall learned that Klaus Barbie, the butcher of Lyon himself, and the person responsible for the torture and deaths of so many of her friends, along with thousands of Jews from that region, was spirited away from his war crimes tribunals to safety as the ultimate anti-Soviet who had information our CIA wanted. His care and feeding, courtesy of the American taxpayer. Eventually, Israeli Nazi hunters tracked Barbie down and hauled him back to Europe to face trial. Eventually condemned to life in prison, he died of leukemia in France in 1991. And it should be noted here that except for the East Asian American agent, Noor Khan, Virginia Hall and all the other American women who enlisted in Britain's intelligence agency managed to survive Nazi brutality from the likes of Klaus Barbie. And it must also be said that Churchill's angels were America's angels too. In the some 80 years since they served both Britain and the United States alongside the male warriors, isn't it about time? They were granted their due and our thanks. So in their honor, I've prepared the World War II drink that was called a Kir Royale. Cheers all. And I'd love to invite you all, yachtsmen and women, to join the celebration of these American women's secret warriors on Sunday, September 12th, 
4 to 6 p.m. at the Sausalito Books by the Bay. That is, if our San Francisco Bay Area isn't on lockdown again by then. So stay tuned. Meanwhile, you can find the links to all the books that I've written on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and the other online retailers. And of course, in bookstores through the Ingram catalog. You just have to say, please order this and they will. So thanks so much. It's been so much fun. And thanks to Ron who organized everything and to all of you at our sister yacht club. CG, how terrific. Thank you so much for sharing your insights, quotes from your books, and all these fun tales. A few questions. Talk to me about the motivation of women who choose to become spies. Well, I think a lot of them were kind of misfits in some way or the other, but they had been raised by Americans and, and well, their parents, if they were British and a combination in Europe. And so they spoke French, which is the their, their ticket to being a special agent as far as the British were concerned. But it's interesting, um, for instance, I think that Devereaux, Dev, the one who was afraid to parachute, she just loved France and she felt she had never done anything useful. She was a playgirl and her mother was always criticizing her. And I think she began to find a purpose in life that she could do something useful. And she really wanted to make her late father proud who had died in World War I as a pilot, which is probably one of the reasons she was terrified of, of being a parachutist and figured out a way to land there. Uh, she got on a short takeoff and landing plane and didn't have to parachute, but she finagled her way by batting her eyelashes and getting herself <laughs> there a different way. I think she slowly evolved from this playgirl to a complete heroine who thought of other people. And she loved the real France and she was infuriated by what had happened and that there were so many French collaborators that she wanted to right a wrong. And she was so brave. And at the end, I mean, I love the arc of her character because when she started out, she was really just drinking too much. All she did was ski. But that talent of skiing was exactly the thing that made her a fabulous secret agent. So what were your research sources? Where did you go to find out about these women? Well, the archives have now been opened. So you can go to Washington. I went to Washington, D.C. I went to the Spy Museum, by the way. Anybody who's in D.C. And they've just moved to a new headquarters. So I want to go again. But the Spy Museum, you go in and there is all the James Bond stuff. It was probably underwritten by the Broccoli Brothers who you know, had the James Bond franchise. But there's the car and all the stuff. And then you go upstairs and our Spy Museum is mostly CIA now, but they include all the World War II stuff. And it's just fascinating. You see the wireless machinery, you see the secret codes, you see lots of photos and everything. Um, so that was one of the best things I did. Then I physically, because I'm a reporter, I went to where I knew these people had been. I read their biographies or I read their autobiographies or I, you know, I found documents and then I made a list of where I needed to go. So I went to the street where Betty compromised the French attache and after lunch took him back to her house. I went to that. I, I found uh, the Vichy embassy uh, in France. You know, I marched across the Plateau de Glière where the battle was fought. I mean, I believe you can't write about things unless you go there, unless you see it. So I was really somebody who would do the reading and dig. And a lot of it is secondary sources now you know, there's so much out there. You don't have to do the original research much uh, for a novel, you know, because a novel is, that's the other tricky thing. It's fact, but it's fiction. And blending the two is very tricky because you don't want to put anything in there that's untrue, but you want to make it exciting. So like you have all these questions you have to answer. At one point, Alan Dulles recruited Devereaux to go to England to go in there. He was in my view, a snake in the end. But anyway, he arrived in Bern, Switzerland in the fall and I had to have him there in the spring. So I put him there in the spring, but in my author's note, I disclosed that on the chessboard. But as long as you disclose what you've done, it's kosher. So there are certain kind of rules of the road when you're writing historical fiction. One scholar said to me, I had a readership for a long time at the Huntington Library, which is a rare book library in Pasadena, in San Marino. And this very illustrious scholar and I were sitting at lunch and he said, 
ooh, you're a novelist? And I said, yeah, what do you write? And I said, I write historical fiction. He goes, there's history and there's fiction and they don't match. <laughs> but I disagree. I think most of us learn our history through movies and through novels. So I feel it's my responsibility to try to make the novel as close to what we know from the documentation is true. So that's kind of my credo. You know, I, I do my best to, if I don't know something, I use intelligent supposition based on what we do know. So uh, how about the Germans learning about our spy network of females? Were they becoming aware at the end of the war? Is there any, uh, any indication that they were all of a sudden getting on to the fact that we had these female spies? They absolutely were because things would start to happen and they would arrest one person and put a cigarette out in his eye to get him to talk. And nobody, I don't care what you say or how brave you are, you will crack. And so they would crack and would say, well, I, I dealt with Virginia Hall in Lyon in order to not be tortured or killed. And, um, and the waterboarding was invented and Klaus Barbary used to stick people's heads down in ammonia. You know, I mean, he was just terrible. The fact we sent him to South America on our tax dollar is really cheesing me off. But anyway, um, that the Germans began to realize pretty quickly by about 42, 43, that there were plenty of women. And also not just women official agents, but resistance women, you know, farmers' wives and shopkeepers' wives helping get the airmen to the next stage on the Underground Railroad out of France. There were so many women that were helping and the Germans by the end of the war realized they had missed the boat, that there were plenty of women that were very, very capable of outfoxing them, but they got caught. And for instance, poor Noor, the one with the postage stamp, she was shot in the back of the head. Another woman was put in the oven alive. These women, women suffered. And Vera Atkins, the woman I said that recruited them and she was in her uniform in one of the pictures, she made it her business after the war to go find out what happened to every single one of the women agents who had not come home. And there's an amazing book um, called A Life of Secrets about her, her and why she tracked down. And her book was very, very helpful to me uh, about what happened to the women who did not come back. You mentioned that Churchill basically uh, dreamed up the idea of using females, otherwise discredited and not suspicious to Germans uh, for their spycraft. How high in the U.S. military was awareness of this practice of using female spies to support the war effort? For a long time, you know, we were very against going into the war. I mean, that was the America Firsters. That was uh, the aviator Lindbergh was leading all this don't get in war. But behind the scenes, um, I think that Roosevelt knew very well we were going to end up in the war. So he were, was friends with a number of people. One was named Wild Bill Donovan, who had been a friend of Churchill's. And Donovan began to consult with a Brit named Stevenson, who was a, an intelligence former officer and was very involved in Britain. And the two of them actually way before we ever got together, they were the ones who cooked up the scheme to steal the naval codes out of the DC French Vichy embassy. It was our guys and their guys way before we were in the war, realizing that we needed to start establishing an intelligence about what the Germans were doing. And so um, it was very high up. And at that same time, we established our OSS right about the same time that the special operations executive in Britain was coming along. The Office of Strategic Services, which was the precursor to our CIA, that was being brought in to being in, as an agency uh, in the 40s. So after a while, some, for instance, Virginia Hall started out as a British agent and ended up in the OSS. So she had kind of a dual assignment because she was so good. And um, the Brits loaned her back to the fledgling uh, OSS. And uh, so there was quite a bit of high up coordination, but we were late 
coming to the party. Were seductress skills, may I use that term, just sort of taken for granted? Was it assumed that when a woman signed up to be a spy that she would ultimately um, have to also become a bit of a seductress? No, but there was a group and they were called Agent Fifi, F-I-F-I, as in Fifi, uh, whatever. And they were used, there were some, but not standard. Um, for instance, there was one woman that was recruited uh, to hang around air bases in England to test out the new recruits in the pub. Would they get drunk and tell, oh, yeah, I'm going to be flown into, you know, and they were washed out by these women who would get them drunk and do everything but go to bed with them and then report back, get rid of this guy. He can't keep a secret. And. For instance, the woman, Betty Pack in D.C., she was a flirt. She was very promiscuous. There's no skin off her back. She didn't care. She And she thought he was very attractive anyway. And then she ended up marrying him in the end. Um, there were So there was a subset of these women. But it was not assumed at all that they would have to put out as part of their job. One of the most interesting things was that a lot of them married other agents after the war because they couldn't tell anyone for 50 years what they had done. And so the only people who understood what they'd gone through and what they had lived through, and they were PTSD victims and we didn't even know what that was back then. And so they married each other. I mean, Betty Pack married somebody, Devereaux was in love with another agent. You go through the list and it was very common that the agents had affairs with each other, which that was very frowned on, but they did. Uh, even if they were married to somebody else, it was tomorrow we die, you know. And so it was curious to me how many ended up marrying other agents. So they had someone to talk to after the war. You're reading about these heroics by these women. Tell us about a hero for you. Well, I ended up writing about the ones that I found the most heroic. And, and um, the first book is, is about Betty Pack, who stole the naval codes. She never went to Europe. So her story is the beginning of that book. And another woman's story is kind of later. And I mushed them together, but they're all one character. Honestly, Devereaux Rochester is my, my heroine because she started as such a kind of useless American spoiled brat, really. And there were reasons why she was so unhappy as a teenager. Um, her mother had married a, basically an American businessman who was kind of a Nazi sympathizer. And she hated her stepfather. You know, And I saw her go from a really unhappy, spoiled brat, acting out teenager to this amazing woman who became extremely selfless and was brave beyond anything and actually jumped out of an airplane in, at, at, at spy school, although she thought she was going to die. She was afraid and she did it anyway. So to me, she epitomized that strength that really, really tested and I just, I'm mad for her. And I, and I don't want to give away the new book because I tell her story and what happened to her in the end. So what would I do? Would I have done that? I don't know. I don't know. Would you have? If I would have been able to do what she did. I hope I would. I know what, I, I would jump out of the airplane. That I would do. <laughs> but all the other scary things she had to do uh, which you learn about in my book, you know, how she mustered up her courage. And also they went months without a cup of coffee. I mean, that would be really bad, you know? <laughs> so uh, there were there was just so much to admire. C.G. Ware, it was so fun to speak with you about your latest book, Spy Above the Clouds. We're all going to run out and buy it right away. We know it's being released in early September. You can buy it in the Saucita Bookstore. We want to thank you for being a guest of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. It's been a delight and informative. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and your enthusiasm for this fascinating subject with us. Thank you, Ron. And thank you so much for inviting me. And I really mean it. We in the Little Sausalito Yacht Club send you all our love and appreciation for what you do for our whole Bay Area. So thank you. And thanks for having me. It was really fun. I enjoyed it so much.
This has been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.